The most severely tested have always been the prophets, vilified and attacked by proud disbelievers wallowing in sin. And the last one, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, suffered immensely. But after every hardship comes ease, and so we begin. After twelve years of calling people to reject idols and worship only one God, he, peace be upon him, was sorely tested by the year of grief. Tragically, his uncle Abu Talib died, whose kinship provided protection from Makkans, now buoyed up as thugs in disbelief. In that year, pagans imposed severe sanctions upon his tribe Banu Hashim, aiming to starve Muslims and make them outcast. Undaunted, he went to Ta'if, inviting to Islam, but they pelted him with stones until he bled and he had to escape really fast. On seeing his blooded sandals, Gabriel said, if the Prophet peace be upon him ordered, he'd crush the Ta'ifans under the mountainous range. But in his mercy, the Prophet peace be upon him stopped him, saying, I pray their children will believe, and Allah brought about that change. In that same year before migration to Medina, he was devastated by the loss of his loving wife Khadija, peace be upon her. While disbelievers closed all doors upon him, Allah didn't forsake him, but opened up the doors of heaven for him in honor. Allah glorified himself on introducing Al-Isra wal-Miraj, the Prophet's miraculous night journey and heavenly ascent, where he was physically taken from Mecca to Jerusalem and then up to the highest heaven. In one night he was sent. Glorified is Allah beyond all the evil they associate with him, who took his slave Muhammad on a journey by night from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa whose precincts we have blessed so we might show him our signs by sight. It all began one night in Umm Hani's house as he peace be upon him slept between his uncle Hamza and cousin Jafar on the floor when the roof of the house split open through which angels entered, picked him out and took him to the Kaaba's door. At the Kaaba's hijr, Angel Gabriel laid the Prophet down and slit him from his neck to his navel, his open chest revealed. His heart was removed and washed with zamzam and filled with faith and wisdom from a gold utensil before being resealed. Gabriel led him to a fabulous heavenly creature called the Burak, a white pony-sized steed who became agitated in alarm. But Gabriel consoled it, saying its rider would be its most honored yet. So Burak broke into a sweat and became very calm. The Burak was the steed of former prophets. For example, Abraham, peace be upon him, rode it to traverse the distance quickly between each spouse. For Sarah and his son Isaac lived in Hebron, but Hagar and Ishmael lived in Mecca, where he built the Kaaba, Allah's house. The Prophet peace be upon him mounted the Burak, amazed to find that with each hoof step it zoomed to the horizon's edge in sight. Completing a month's journey within seconds, it leapt from Makkah's Kaaba to Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque in one night. He dismounted the Burak and tied it to the hitching post of the Prophets in Jerusalem and two units of prayer performed. Then Gabriel led him to the rock from which the mirage ascended to heaven by a ladder or stairway angelically adorned. The mirage is a glorious vision that the dying person's eyesight is drawn towards where angels carry souls beyond the sky. The Prophet peace be upon him was privileged to pass through that portal up to the heavens in body and soul and he peace be upon him never told a lie. Gabriel accompanied him to the first heaven's gate, guarded by angelic gatekeepers whose permission must be sought. Following angelic protocol, Gabriel identified himself, but the angels wanted to know who was the man he had brought. Angel Gabriel told them it was Muhammad, peace be upon him, to which they asked, Has his mission started? with delightful refrain. When he replied affirmatively, they cheered, Marhaban, or welcome. Indeed, he is the best of those who ever came. 
So the gate to the first heaven was opened, and the prophet peace be upon him was welcomed in joy as Gabriel offered him a drink. He was given a choice between wine or milk, and he chose the milk. To the natural disposition did Gabriel make a link. Milk was linked to the fitra, for it's a baby's first food, doesn't intoxicate, and symbolically showed Islam's perfection. Gabriel said, had you chosen wine, your ummah or nation would have been misguided. So milk was a purer selection. Of course, the Prophet's journey occurred in the Meccan period when wine wasn't forbidden but Islamically legislated. Gabriel said, you've been guided in your decision, meaning that God intended to spare believers from being intoxicated. After he was satiated, Gabriel led him into the first heaven, towards Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, the first man God ever created. Angel Gabriel introduced him, saying, This is your father, give him your greetings or salams, which he did, truly elated. Adam responded and added, You are most welcome, O pious prophet and pious son, and prayed for his well-being. It's interesting how each heavenly level strengthened the Prophet's certainty as preparation by Allah, the All-Seeing. In the first heaven, he met Adam, peace be upon him, who was cast out of heaven but repented and regained entry by Allah's grace. On reflection, the Prophet, peace be upon him, could remain hopeful after expulsion from Mecca that he'd return to his birthplace. On leaving the first heaven, he saw Adam weeping at souls to his left, but laughing at souls to his right gathered round. When he inquired, he was told that Adam, peace be upon him, wept for his offspring destined for hell, but laughed at the heaven bound. Angel Gabriel then lifted the Prophet, peace be upon him, to the second heaven, repeating angelic entry protocols at this second location. There he met and greeted the two maternal cousins, John and Jesus, or Yahya and Isa, peace be upon them, a truly joyous occasion. Jesus responded saying, Welcome, O pious prophet and pious brother, who looked as if he'd just bathed, his face a blush. The prophet, peace be upon him, noted Jesus as being of medium build, with red-white skin tone and shoulder-length hair, straight and plush. On reflection, he, peace be upon him, could remain firm against Jewish foes who killed John and Zachariah and boasted of killing Jesus too, and that he would overcome their opposition after migration, as their sly rejection of God's messengers was nothing new. Fascinatingly, the Prophet said that Jesus, peace be upon them both, is currently in the second heaven in body and soul, awaiting his return. The Prophet said that Jesus and he, peace be upon them both, were as close to each other as two fingers, and Jesus, peace be upon him, will have another turn. He was then lifted to the third heaven, where he met Joseph, or Yusuf, peace be upon him, by Gabriel repeating protocols, as was his duty. He, peace be upon him, mentioned that people in heaven would look like Joseph or his mother, for they were given one half of all beauty. On reflection, he, peace be upon him, would remain magnanimous, for Joseph, left for dead by his brothers, forgave them after gaining rule. Likewise, his own kinfolk would try to murder him, but upon victory, he would forgive them, even though they were very cruel. In the fourth heaven, he met Enoch, or Idris, peace be upon him, who Allah said was a truthful prophet, who he raised up to a high station. Enoch was also raised up bodily to the heavens before his death in the fourth, and experienced the prophet's elevation. On reflection, he, peace be upon him, would be consoled that he wasn't the only one to experience the Miraj, as Enoch had already been. Enoch was also the first to write with a pen, and although Muhammad, peace be upon him, was unread, they were equals on the same team. In the fifth heaven, he met Aaron, or Harun, peace be upon him, who gave support to his brother Moses and started the priestly line. Even though Israelites indulged in idolatry, Aaron guided the pious to stay monotheist, as would the Prophet, peace be upon him, over time. In the sixth heaven, he met Moses, or Musa, peace be upon him, seen as a dark-skinned man with curly hair, like handsome Shanua blacks. Upon reflection, he, peace be upon him, would say that Moses was tried severely by the children of Israel, but weathered their attacks. On his way up to the next level, 
The angels noticed Moses' peace be upon him crying, and asked him why. So he replied without any resent, This ghulam, or young man's ummah, or nation, will have more followers than me on the last day, without envy or dissent. In the final seventh heaven he met Abraham, or Ibrahim, peace be upon him, whom he greeted as he did to Adam, peace be upon him, like a father to a son. Abraham was the father of Jews and Arabs as well, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that he looked like him second to none. Abraham was resting his back against the Baytul Ma'mur, or oft-visited house, which the Kaaba mimics in its role. Every day, 70,000 angels circle around it, never to return to it again, performing pilgrimage, a once-in-a-lifetime goal. Prophet Abraham then entered lush gardens, surrounded by the souls of infants who had died in their innocent state. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was consoled that anyone who entered Islam would have their prior sins wiped clean from their slate. Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, asked Muhammad, peace be upon him, to remind believers that paradise was spacious and fertile with musk for soil. As the Prophet, peace be upon him, looked around, he saw tents made out of pearls and bejeweled mansions, rewards for those who toil. He was thrilled to have met Abraham, Khalilullah, or the friend of Allah. But then Gabriel told him to walk to an elevation and took him to a glorious tree called the Sidratul Muntaha, or the furthest lot tree, for a magnificent revelation. He noticed four rivers emanating below it, two showing the Nile and Euphrates, and two hidden with a shimmering flow. The lot tree's leaves were as big as elephant ears, and its fruits like six-foot Yemeni jugs, beyond which angels do not go. Gabriel halted at its boundary, but urged the Prophet peace be upon him to go on, passing angels who record God's decrees as scribes. Angels alighted on the tree like starlings or golden butterflies, and it lit up in colors and lights impossible to describe. All of a sudden, the tree lit up with an amazing, wondrous glow, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, moved in awe towards Allah's throne. Gabriel stepped back in his angelic form with six hundred bejeweled wings, while Muhammad, peace be upon him, walked into veils of light alone. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, was asked whether or not he saw Allah, he said he didn't, as Allah was beyond many veils of light. Yet the greatest prize in paradise will be to see Allah with our eyes, above his throne, in a manner that befits his might. Words cannot describe what happened next, but sufficient is that mortal men are only able to see Allah after they die. It was in their meeting that Allah decreed that all who die without committing idolatry or shirk will enter paradise. Also revealed during that momentous event were the last two verses of Surah Baqarah, as Allah's speech in the Qur'an, but due to the intervention of Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, the daily prayers were reduced from fifty to five for the followers of Islam. For when the Prophet, peace be upon him, went back to the sixth heaven, Moses, peace be upon him, asked how many prayers God had decreed, so he could advise. When told it was fifty, he insisted the Prophet, peace be upon him, ask for a reduction, as Jews had found it hard to comply or to compromise. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, kept on going back to obtain a reduction, granted by Allah's mercy, indicating Islam's ease by intent, until he felt shy. Then God decreed, I have reduced the prayers from fifty to five, each one given a reward equal to ten. Finally, Gabriel took him on his journey back, where he not only saw the wonders of paradise, but also the horrors of hell. On one extreme he saw the gold brick house of Omar, and on the other he saw adulterers burning in a narrow-necked well. He heard the footsteps of Muezzin Bilal, but also saw takers of usury with snakes writhing in bloated bellies being trod. He saw faces of backbiters being cut with copper nails, but saw formed into treasures thicker or the remembrance of God. He saw rivers of milk, wine and honey, 
but also scissors of fire cutting the lips of those who don't practice as they preach. He saw tree trunks made of gold, but fire entering and exiting those who pilfered an orphan's wealth out of their reach. He saw angel Malik, the unsmiling keeper of hell, and gave him salams, but saw fruits of Jannah of a dazzling array. He saw the Zakum tree of hell, with hurtful berries and stalks of snake heads, but saw heaven's gardens all in a day. He even saw Dajjal, the Antichrist, blind in his right eye, the other a murky green, biding his time, but soon to appear. It was all very exhilarating and a great honor, but eventually Gabriel led him back towards Earth's mundane sphere. When he alighted at his departure point in Jerusalem, he was welcomed by all the former prophets who had ever been. In fact, all 124,000 were assembled, and he recognized Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, peace be upon them all, amongst others that were seen. All of God's prophets lined up in a row behind him, and he was honored to lead them in prayer, indicating his position. He led them in Fajr or dawn prayer in the new daily format, being the last prophet and seal, completing God's mission. Now, for those who don't pray their five daily prayers, please comprehend their importance and their magnificent initiation. In fact, the prophet, peace be upon him, said, abandoning the five prayers breaks the covenant between him and us, so fulfill your obligation. Then he mounted the Burak for the return journey, and on the way back to Mecca, a Syrian trade caravan he did spot. A camel bolted, startled by the Burak, but he stopped by another train to see if a drink of water was available or not. All the trade crews were fast asleep, so he drank water from their covered containers left for the public to partake. As they were headed for Mecca, he noted the caravan's details like sacks on camels, estimating how long they'd take. For if a camel train travelled 25 miles per day, the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem would take a month to complete. So when Gabriel returned Muhammad, peace be upon him, to the Hijr of the Kaaba, he worried how he would explain such an amazing feat. As he sat in anguish over how he would go about telling the people about his overnight trip, along came the worst one. Abu Jahl noticed the sad look on the Prophet's face and quipped, Do you have any news? in earnest whilst poking fun. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, I was taken on a journey last night, relaying the event. You went to Beit al-Maqdis last night and sit here this morning? If I call the people, will you repeat what you just said? He, peace be upon him, replied affirmatively, and as he addressed them, Makkan heads shook in disbelief as they clapped and jeered. Many who had warmed to Islam now turned on their heels, and the Prophet's enemies had a field day as they cheered. Some quizzed Abu Bakr, who replied, If Muhammad, peace be upon him, said so, then I believe him. So they accused him of being a freak. He added, I believe in greater. God's revelation descends to him from heaven. Hence his epithet, true believer, or a Sadiq. Others knew the Prophet, peace be upon him, had never been to Jerusalem and vowed to accept his story if he only described it all clear. As he did so, he felt unsure. So Allah raised a vision of Jerusalem before his eyes. So he described it in detail without fear. They were still in doubt. So he, peace be upon him, described the trade caravan its estimated time of arrival, and his own interactions. But even though the camel train came in exactly as he had predicted, they stuck to opposition and disbelieving factions. Next day, Gabriel taught the Prophet, peace be upon him, the new prayer and daily timings, who in turn led the Muslims in Dhuhr at noon. It wasn't long before the Makkans demanded a miracle but still turned away after seeing the Prophet, peace be upon him, split the moon. Subsequently, Jerusalem's Christian patriarch recalled a night when Al-Aqsa's door stayed ajar, as immovable as a mountain, and by daylight he verified that the cornerstone had a hole with traces of a riding beast tethered and ready for mounting.